Welcome to another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I am the founder of Teach the Geek. I work with technical professionals so they can present more effectively, especially in front of non-technical audiences. To learn more about that, you can go to teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Today, my guest is Dr. Madeline Oden, an assistant professor. Her research focuses on learning how cancer spreads throughout the body. She's also an epilepsy researcher. One other thing, she's or, she organizes conferences in her spare time. At least she's co-organizing one for the Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine International Society, or term is for short. I'm interested to learn more about her decision to become an, an academic, her choice of research interests, and what it takes to organize a conference. Hopefully she knows that to organize a conference, you have to have snacks and they have to be plentiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Welcome to, to Teach the Geek interviews, Dr. Oden. Thank you. So from the bit of research I did on you, I saw that you got your bachelor's degree in biochemistry. What was the motivation to get that degree? Yeah, I just loved um, science in high school. Um, I loved biology, I loved chemistry. So when I was looking at majors, you know, at the time in this big book that you would look at, now it's all online, but I looked at biology, but I saw there was a lot of stuff related to plants and ecology, and I was really more interested in the human body. Um, so I turned the page and I saw biochemistry and I thought, oh, this is cool. This kind of brings together my interest both in chemistry and biology. And so that's how I uh, picked biochemistry. So it's pretty, pretty random, but, you know, based off my interests. But you didn't stop there. You got degrees in, in pharmacology and, and neuroscience. What was the motivation to get those degrees? Yeah. So like many people who start um, in kind of science majors as an undergrad, I was interested in medical school. I thought I wanted to, to be a clinician. Uh, but along the way, I started learning more about the research um, and, you know, how different scientists had led experiments to make discoveries about the human body and how it works and, and drugs to treat patients. So I thought that was really cool. And I decided to kind of put my med school plans on pause and do some research and do a master's. So I did a master's in pharmacology and I was able to um, work in a neuroscience lab and study how uh, newly generated cells in the adult brain move around and how we could treat them with different compounds to see different effects on their behaviors. And I just really loved being in the lab. I thought it was just so much fun. And um, I love, you know, discovering new things. And so I then stayed on for a PhD in the same lab in neuroscience and, uh, you know, continuing to study how these newly generated cells move in the brain. Okay. You know, I also thought about going to medical school too, but I don't know if you remember the TV show ER. Yes. So I used to watch that show and I used to see how the residents had to sleep at the hospital. And they didn't get a whole lot of sleep. And that's when yeah. those medical school dreams died because I, <laughs> I need my eight hours. <laughs> yeah. For sure, for yeah. sure. So you have a degree in biochemistry, you have a degree in pharmacology, you have a degree in neuroscience, and you're an assistant professor in a biomedical engineering department. How did that, how did that turn out? Yeah, so after my PhD, I decided I wanted to do a postdoctoral uh, fellowship. I was interested in academia, but, uh, you know, just wanted to learn more and um, gain more expertise. And so, uh, but I was studying how cells in the brain move around, but this was in the adult brain. So this process called adult neurogenesis, where, you know, even in the adult brain, some new cells are generated, but there's not that many. And we're not sure how they contribute exactly to brain function. And so I wanted to do something that was a bit more kind of clinically relevant. You know, I still kind of had that passion to, you know, help people and that my research could in some way lead to new treatments for a disease. And I learned that cancer cells move around as well. And this is the process of metastasis, which is when tumors uh, leave their primary tumor site and go to other organs in the body. And this is the leading cause of death in cancer patients. Once the cancer has spread, it's really hard to treat. So I decided to apply my knowledge of neuroscience to cancer and studying how cancer cells move in the body. And so that was really fun and I ended up going to MIT which is also full of engineers. And so I was able to work with engineers um, and apply different engineering methods to the study of cancer. And I, I thought that was super fun, very creative, allowed me to kind of, you know, just try different things and, and look at things from a different lens. And so, you know, that's kind of really what biomedical engineering is. It's applying different technologies and engineering methods to solving biological problems. And so 
when I applied for faculty positions at universities that seemed like the best fit for, for my research interests and, and kind of the area that I wanted to work in. Okay. So from the beginning of when you started your undergrad to when you stopped doing a postdoc and got a position in as a professor, how, how many years was that? Yeah, that was um 14 years. Jesus Christ. <laughs> wow, yeah. 14 years. Man, they yeah. better have had a position for you after 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd have been pissed. No, <laughs> I need a job. No, I'm putting my time. So, you know, you mentioned that you, well, I, I mentioned also in the intro that you, you, you do cancer research, but then I also mentioned that you do epilepsy research. So how'd you come to epilepsy? Yeah, that's a new area. Uh, my daughter, who's 19 months old, was recently diagnosed with a mutation in a gene that causes epilepsy. And so, um, you know, because of my background in neuroscience, because of some of the work I've been doing in cancer, actually studying how nerves, you know, part of the nervous system interact with tumor cells as well, I thought, okay, I think I can uh, maybe contribute in epilepsy as well and help kind of shed more light on a lot of these rare diseases that are uh, caused by mutations that can cause epilepsy. And so it's a kind of a new collaboration with myself and my husband, who's also a researcher, and also some epilepsy labs um, at Tufts. So, um, you know, it's a new area, but, you know, there's a lot of similarities between cancers and the developing brain. And, and so, um, you know, I'm able to kind of take advantage of all the things that I know about cancer and um, kind of bring a different perspective to looking at epilepsy. And so that's uh, a new area for us. Okay. So as an assistant professor, you have to run a lab. What are the things that perhaps you weren't prepared for in, in doing that and running a lab? Yeah. I mean, I think as, as a postdoc, you know, you're, you're running experiments, you're in the lab most of the time, you know, you're writing some papers, mentoring some students, but generally, you know, your main responsibility is writing papers. And sorry, it's doing research and then publishing that and presenting and, and mentoring. When you get to be a professor and running a lab, suddenly you're also, you know, uh, applying for lots and lots of grants, managing budgets, hiring people, um, lots of administrative tasks within, you know, running this kind of small company that you, you started within a university. And really, you don't have as much time at all to do experiments. And so it's just a huge shift in kind of your day-to-day -day tasks between this postdoc to then the next day being a faculty, um, buying equipment, getting that organized, getting all the proper documents in place for the safety of the different uh, projects you're working on, uh, protocols. So, um, you know, it's, it's definitely a huge shift um, in what you're doing, but you also get to mentor a lot more people and, you know, you get to see them um, learn different methods, do experiments, collect data, train them to, you know, be more independent in their careers, um, be more independent as researchers. And you get to do that on a much bigger scale than you ever, uh, you know, could do uh, before being a faculty. And so that's also extremely rewarding too, and uh, in different ways. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is. With the people that, that come through your lab, are they mostly master students or PhD students or, or postdocs, a mix of both? Yeah, oh, it's okay. a mix. So um, have master's, PhDs, postdocs, and also lots of undergrads um, that do research in our labs as well. Okay, got it. So it's, it's a full house. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. you got more than enough room and space and, and, and opportunities for all these people. You know, I've, I've had other academics on the on the podcast before, and I'm always curious about their decision to, at least the decision of the people that come through their labs. Do they stay in academia or do they go into industry? What has, what has been your experience with the with the people in your lab? It's it's been a mix. Um, it really, um, yeah, it's been a mix. So my first postdoc uh, who was in the lab, she ended up staying in academia and starting her lab. But the other ones so far have gone to to one of them has gone to industry. From the PhD student side, it's also a mix. Um, so yeah, it, it's a mix. I think it's great, and I try to you know give students exposure to different areas and different um, opportunities, you know, even as PhD students to interact with people in the community, um, even do some internships that are, you know, just kind of a couple hours a week to get exposed to, you know, different careers within the biotech or kind of biomedical research space. Um, because there's so many options out there and, you know, it's important for students to find what they're passionate about. Um, 
And, you know, it's, sometimes it's not areas that I'm familiar with because obviously I stayed in academia, so I don't know, but I try to connect them a lot with people that I know or other alumni to, to learn about um, other careers and, you know, and find their passion. Yeah. You know, and I had another guest on my podcast, uh, Dr. David Giltner, and he has a PhD too. And, and he actually does a lot of speaking on the move to, to industry in the event that you don't stay in academia. And one of the, I guess, the reasons that he even does what he does is the people that are thinking about that move don't necessarily have the support of the people from the university because a lot of them, they're, they're career academics, so they don't know all that much about industry. But it's great for the people that are under you to have someone like you. So even though you don't have that industry background, you at least know people or maybe, maybe are willing to point them in the right direction so they at least have some sort of, of guidance. So thank you on behalf of, of your students for, for doing that. Yeah. So no, it's I, I also mentioned that you were co-organizing a, a conference with Termis. What made you decide to get into that? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, you know, like to organize things. Um, I always have. And even as a grad student within um, my PhD the cohort in the in the research center I was, I would organize um, like days where we would have like social activities and, and hang out and get to know each other better, uh, different activities. So I like to, you know, I do think kind of um, bringing people together and um, getting to know people, different building community, being able to talk about research to people is so important. And for me, what really made me want to stay in, in academic research was attending conferences and being able to talk to the experts, the people who, you know, I had read their papers, I knew who they were, but I'd never met them. And just the chance to chat with them, either over my research or even at breakfast or for, for with for, over a drink or coffee, that really excited me. And I loved being able to, you know, talk about science and discuss things. And so I've loved attending conferences. Um, and so I've participated in organizing a few I try to encourage my students to go as well uh, for that experience. Uh, and so I think it's a hu it's really important part of being a researcher, being able to go present your work, discuss with people, meet people. And so I'm happy to kind of keep continuing to support that for the community. Nice. You know, I also had another former guest on the podcast, Dr. Darren Lapomi, and he's a, I think he's an associate professor in, in nanoengineering here at, in, in San Diego, where I am, UC San Diego. And I remember during our conversation, we ended up talking about giving conference talks. And he said that oftentimes when you are giving, well, when it comes to speaking in general, the audience kind of wants to see you succeed. They don't want to see you fail. But I said, I don't know about that, Dr. Lapone. I can think of many instances where I've been at a conference talk and somebody might ask a question from a, from a, a, a not a neighboring lab, from a competing lab something to kind of trip up the grad student or trip up the postdoc or even trip up the professor during the, during the, during the presentation. And, and you can see the kind of contention going back and forth. So I don't know if everybody's always want to see you, see you succeed. Is that something you've ever experienced? Yeah. I mean, I've definitely had some tough questions for sure. Um, and, you know, you have to find, you know, a way to handle them gracefully. If, if you do know or kind of can contribute scientifically, do it. If you don't know, then just saying, that's a great question. I, I don't know. Um, I've also seen some very tense exchanges between other, you know, people at conferences uh, over data and things like that. So, yeah, that can definitely happen. Um, I think generally most people, you know, mean well and want to have a, just a deep scientific debate, but sometimes it can be hard to have, you know, kind of in the question and answer session, and that's better suited for, you know, later on in, in the meeting. And, and it can be kind of intimidating when people question your, your science for sure. And you, it's easy to take that really personally too. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of the time people just want to, you know, make sure they're clear on what's right or what's happening, or if they've seen something different, try and explain it. So you definitely get better with it over time, but it can definitely be intimidating. Oh, sure. And I, I firmly believe that they do, they do it on purpose. <laughs> they absolutely want to make you look bad. <laughs> Especially if they're competing labs. It's like we're competing for, for research dollars and we're competing for the ears and minds of the people. No, I, I want to make you look bad. But, but, <laughs> but in the event that that doesn't happen, then you know, there, there are certainly ways to do it. I, I actually suggested to Dr. Lapomi that if it gets bad, you got to take some people outside and beat them. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you, word, the word, enough with the words. Now you got to see fists. 
<laughs> you know, you know, if people thought that was a, a possibility, maybe they might be a bit more polite. <laughs> but you know, from the from, I want to tell you a little bit about why I even started this podcast in the first place. And I, you know, I mentioned that in the beginning, I work with with technical professionals to improve their public speaking. But it really started with me and having to get better at giving presentations, especially at my second job when I was working as an engineer. When did you see the benefit of getting better at giving presentations or or public speaking in general? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that um, I was grateful I was able to practice early on in grad school where we had to give um, talks even within our university for annual symposium, even within your lab meeting every week and, you know, getting um, feedback from people. Um, yeah, being able to practice, um, being able to also watch other people give talks and see what what did you enjoy about their talk? You know, um, I think going to conferences and seeing a you know broader range of how people presented, people have different styles and see what what do you think works. Um, so I think you know really being able to practice a lot um, and also being able to see kind of how other people do it and and pick kind of the the styles or or things that worked that I enjoyed. Um, and then I think, um, you know, I mean, obviously teaching, which I, I started as a faculty, you know, now I'm giving lectures twice a week, you know, that's a lot of experience to, you know, speak and explain things. Um, I think, you know, that kind of has helped a lot. And I also did a lot of outreach um, in my postdoc where, you know, I uh, tried to convey scientific topics to uh, younger children of, of different ages, uh, trying to break things down and explain you know, uh, a complex topic that I worked on in the lab to, um, you know, younger, younger children or, or even adults who are not in science and the ability to really break that down and explain it to people. Um, I think that helps me be clearer and be able to present better as well and to focus on what's important and not get bogged down in, in the little details. Um, and so I think all those things have really, um, helped me, uh, be better at, at presenting. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, well, well, what you're doing is is definitely useful and worthwhile. I, I commend you for trying to take your science and make it so that the lay person, for someone that doesn't have your your technical expertise, didn't stay in in school for 14 years. Good lord, that they, they can actually understand what what you're doing, and I, I'm sure that it translates into the work that you do at, at the university as well. You said you teach a course. You said two times a week. What what courses do you teach? Yeah, so right now I teach um, a sophomore biomedical engineering class that is focused on uh, basic biology and how engineering methods are used to study biology. So it's kind of the intro bio class for our BME majors. Um, and then uh, and then in the spring, I'm actually starting a new course focused more on cancer and engineering. That's more kind of upper level um, undergrad and grad students. Okay. Do you have a process for putting your presentations together? And if so, what is it? Yeah, I, I rely a lot on schematics. So I did also take some time to really learn how to use Illustrator. Um, and I was able to take some courses to, uh, when I was a postdoc, to learn how to make, you know, nice scientific diagrams. And so that has helped me a lot because I rely on schematics either to summarize things or to kind of break down different components. And, you know, there are some great ones that are that are published, but when you're trying to kind of focus in on specific features of your um, of your work, you know, you can't break apart the image in the way that you want, or there might be other stuff in there that's not relevant to what you're talking about. So for me making, being able to make my own diagrams where I can kind of focus in on, on different parts that are really relevant to my talk, that has helped um, a lot. And I've gotten lots of positive feedback on that and that I'm, you know, able to, um, you know, it helps to kind of visualize things and explain things better. Um, one thing I've had to work on is speak more slowly. I used to speak very fast and I still do sometimes. So that's something I'm still working on. I'm trying to pace myself and not, not try to fit in too much in a talk. I think sometimes you, you really want to show off everything you've done and, and just go into everything. And I think, you know, you can't always do that. And so you need to focus and it's better to have a bit less, but do a good job of presenting that clearly than presenting everything. Um, and I think really knowing the audience that that you have, um, you know, if I present to undergrads versus to cancer researchers versus to engineers, like I will present it differently because I know that 
they each come with different backgrounds and different knowledge and different ways in which they will see our data. And so I try to tailor it specifically to them and make, you know, changes that to make sure everyone can understand what I'm doing, focus on what they'll find interesting um, and, and kind of tailor to those different audiences. You know, I think it's really smart that you focus on using visuals in your presentations because I, I know from a lot of the conferences that I used to go to when I worked in medical devices as an engineer, there would be a whole lot of text on them slides and they'd be up there reading them slides and I'd be falling asleep while they were reading the slides. <laughs> but yeah. if they had a lot more visuals, it's, it's really more, it's more helpful to just kind of keep people's attention. And not only that, but it actually, it forces the presenter to actually look at the people because there's nothing to look at on the screen yeah. really, it's just a picture. So you yeah. really have to look at the people and you look at the people, they're way more likely to actually listen to what you're saying. So kudos to you for that. And yeah, I'm actually, I'm guilty of speaking a bit fast too. So that's definitely something that I also look at too. And it's it's really helpful to, to slow down, especially for people whose first language isn't English. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, they, they, they're, they're trying their best to really keep up with what you're saying. But yeah. if you're saying it really quickly, it's, it's you're, you're making it harder for them. So Good for you for even knowing noticing that's something that you need to improve on. And then also knowing your audience. That's that's a big one. That's that's definitely not something that I did when I first started giving presentations. And it, it made all the difference because what I thought what I saw happening is I'd get questions after the presentation that I thought I had answered during the presentation. But because I didn't put things in a way that the audience could understand, now I'm getting these questions. I was already sweating during the damn presentation. Now I'm really sweating after the presentation. It was just it was a sweaty mess. So this is definitely something that I came to understand as well. Do you ever get nervous before giving a presentation? And if so, how do you deal with your nerves? Yeah, I still do. Um, definitely, especially if it's in front of a bigger audience. Um, and so, yes, that still still happens. Um, and I think I, I practice a lot. Um, that's also something I did when I was younger and, you know, um, giving like shorter talks at meetings where it was like a 10 minute talk or a 15 minute talk. And, you know, which you often get as a student or as a postdoc. And, you know, I would really like write out everything I would say, practice it, get the language right. And then over time, you know, I would start being able to say it without reading it, but I would really spend a lot of time practicing to myself, to my peers, um, to make sure I made it on time. There's nothing worse than like having that red buzzer, like you're running out of time and you still have stuff to say and like you're stressed and then that makes things like so much worse. So I always, you know, try to make sure that I, you know, know what I'm going to say, um, you know, how to say it in the clearest way, know that I won't go over time, you know, or if I do just a tiny bit, but that, you know, I practiced enough that I, that I know that. And so I think that's, you know, being really prepared has helped me um, feel more, more confident. But yeah, I still, I still get nervous for sure. I really like what you just said, Dr. Odin, about knowing the time. That is one of the biggest pet peeves of mine. You were yeah. given 10 minutes yeah. to speak. Why are you still speaking at 11 minutes? Oh my God. That's, 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 especially at a conference. Where there's a there's an agenda and it throws yeah. the whole agenda up. Well, you're gonna know yeah. you're gonna know this because you're organizing a conference. You're gonna see this up 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 close and personal, especially yeah. if it's maybe a senior level person. You don't want to cut them off because they're they're top level, they're tenured. You know, for you know, fifty billion years they've been they've had their tenure. You, yeah. You're really gonna cut them off? You're gonna pull them off the stage? But you're looking at the top. You're looking at the clock. You're thinking, man, this person had thirty minutes. Damn it, why are they still talking? Other people need to talk. But yeah, I, I firmly believe that. And and practicing the time is is a way to, to get a, is to to fix that issue so that you don't get up there and and go over time and just practice so that you finish within time. And yeah. I actually have a, a a friend, and he actually teases me about practicing my presentations before I give them and practicing them for time. He's way more a fan of just kind of getting up there and winging it. But you definitely see the difference. He goes over time all the time. And I doubt he cares. <laughs> I care. I'm in the audience mad. <laughs> like, like, shut up already, damn it. Okay, so if you had to give one tip to the people watching or listening to our conversation about becoming more effective at giving presentations, what would it be? Yeah, I think, like I said, kind of practice. And, and both even it's just by yourself, like, um, you know, uh, giving presentations to, to, to just a blank audience of just being able to practice and, and know what you're going to say and be comfortable saying it and knowing how you want to say something to make it most effective. And then trying to get feedback from people that you can trust and that, you know, will be supportive. 
Um, and because, you know, you can see something and it can be clear in your mind, but then you present it to different people and, you know, they might disagree on certain points or make you emphasize. And so it's really great to have that, you know, feedback from people that, you know, can give you constructive feedback that is helpful, that are wanting to improve um, your skills. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of feedback too, but with a, ca a caveat, you definitely have to run it through your own filter. I remember yeah. once I gave a, a presentation and I was told by one person, I really, I really liked your eye contact. But I was told by another person, improve your eye contact. <laughs> you got <laughs> to figure out oh, who am I going to listen to? So you very well could get, you get constructive criticism, get that feedback, but then you got to run it through your own mind and see, and think to yourself, is this something that I, I agree with? Is this something I, I, I want to get better at? And the eye contact, at least for me, is definitely something that I want to get better at. As, in addition to, as I mentioned earlier, speaking a bit slower. So this has been a great conversation. Thank you again for being a guest. How can people get in touch with you? Yeah, you can find me um, on uh, Twitter. I'm pretty active with our science, just with my name, Madeline Odin, and our lab website, madelineodinlab.com. And there are emails and stuff on that as well. Excellent. Well, everyone, that marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson, founder of Teach the Geek. You can find out more about Teach the Geek at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Dr. Odin. Thanks.